Welcome, everybody. Welcome. It's great to have uh, such a wonderful turnout for uh, the next of our uh, McCloskey Lecture Series. Uh, exciting to be able to host the Mayor of Los Angeles. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Great to be here. Uh, we have a dynamic uh, uh, interviewee. We have a great, well-informed audience. We have the listeners of Aspen Public Radio. Uh, it's going to be a great Don't time. Don't forget to renew your subscriptions. And we've got some great pledge uh, gifts this year. There, you, heard, you heard it here. <laughs> uh, and we'll take about uh, 40 minutes or so of Q&A here and then uh, open it up to you. So, um, so first of all, thank you. Being mayor of a big city means you are never off the job. You're never asleep. The phones are ringing all the time. Um, so what do you love most about being the mayor of Los Angeles? Well, I love my town, first of all. I'm, I'm one of these rare unicorns in Los Angeles. I'm a fourth generation native. Um, there aren't a lot of us uh, there. 63% of my city is either immigrants or children of immigrants. And if you include migrants from inside the US, it's probably you know one out of 10 people are actually from LA. But I also love the immediacy of being a mayor in this, not only my city, in this moment in history, in this kind of confluence of geography that is LA, but also just cities in general, which I think at a moment when people are feeling so helpless and hopeless, either about our ability to solve problems or the tenor of problem solving in groups, I think the city runs against a lot of those negative feelings. It's a place where we can kind of quench our thirst and reestablish breathing a little bit of hope back into democracy and into the world, um, not just here in the US, but around the world. And you've really pulled the community together to make some big impacts over the last few years. And I'll come back to that. But I want to stay on this theme about the, the, as a unit for leadership, the, the city and the metropolitan area is a chance to really make differences in a way that maybe political leaders weren't thinking about the same way 20 years ago. Is there a shift of mindset? I think it's a shift backwards. It's back to the future. It, there's, I think, not just a coincidence that this coincidence the same root for politics uh, comes from the same word for city in Greek, polis. So the root of moving to the city was to engage in politics. Politics wasn't seen as something negative. It was part of the responsibility of living in a place. And you know, Aristotle said in politics that the city came into being to preserve life, but it exists for the good life. In other words, we came to cities to be safe, but that's not the end goal. The end goal was to find and define what the good life means to each one of us. And so I think it's going back to that moment. When you think about it, the city is the only organic political entity. States are the accidents of history and war. Uh, states, American states within our country are kind of arbitrary historical borders. But a city is a place you come to and you either stay or move to, move from. So it's the only kind of organic unit of politics. And so I don't think it's moving to something radically new. It's kind of returning to what was. That's so interesting. Um, do, do you, as a mayor, work with other mayors in the US and uh, globally? There's an astounding fellowship of mayors, um, globally and uh, within the United States. Uh, there's the US Conference of Mayors, which I participate in. I chair a number of groups, uh, climate mayors, which are the mayors, a bipartisan group of mayors around the country uh, taking action to address climate change. I'm vice chair of something called the C40 that Mike Bloomberg started, which is a global environmental uh, group. Um, City Lab is a gathering that I usually participate in of mayors. And even on the private side, you know, I just texted a couple mayors after I landed uh, here. When there's something going down in a city, a fire, uh, we reach out to each other, something bad happens, something good happens. It becomes a group of folks that really are, you know, a, a, a confederation of folks that you can reach out to and say, what did you do in this situation? You can look up and have mentors. You can mentor folks that are coming up uh, who are younger in their service. And it's a really remarkable uh, thing that I wish American people knew more about. One quick story, in Boston two weeks ago at the US Conference of Mayors, I hosted a dinner for maybe about 25 mayors, uh, Cincinnati, Miami, um, you know, for all around the country. And a couple of the mayors were talking all night uh, about immigration, about climate change, and they're on the same page on those things. And at the end of the dinner, one of them asked the other, by the way, what party are you? Yeah. And the Democrat from Cincinnati, I think, didn't know that the Republican from uh, Miami was that and vice versa. And it showed you that there still is a space and a place to actually address problems together and not start with, tell me who you are in terms of your affiliation before I get to know who you are 
as a person. No, I know, like I said, I know you've gotten big things done in LA and there may be some big things you would like to do for the country, but before we get there, is it okay if we go back in time, sure. give you the chance to talk a little bit about your background and I was have- born at the Good Samaritan Hospital. In <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, so first, your family background. Um, your father is a pretty well-known person for being uh, 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 the district attorney in Los Angeles in a time when there were a number of high-profile cases of various types. But you, you weren't a child when he was in that role. So how did you grow up? I grew up uh, in an area of Los Angeles called the San Fernando Valley, made famous by, you know, Valley Girl. Some, some, all right, Val, hey, <laughs> Val, represent the Resnicks are in the house. Hey, guys. Um, it is kind of middle America. Yeah. Um, it is everywhere. It felt like the center of the world because Brady Bunch literally was filmed there, but also was anonymous land. Um, my father was a public, uh, was a civil servant, excuse me. He, he wasn't an elected DA till after I graduated college. Uh, my mom ran a charitable foundation. And, you know, I'm your average American. I have an Italian last name. I'm half Mexican American, half Jewish. Try to figure out that math. But if you can't get elected with that diversity in LA, good luck anywhere. Um, but it's. <laughs> I, I grew up kind of being a border crosser, I'll say provocatively, like being very comfortable crossing cultural borders. My parents raised me traveling and being in and of the world because they had met working for Pan Am Airlines as, as fresh out of college, and so they used to travel quite a bit, and also with the ethic of service. I think service and being in and engaged in the world were kind of the two things this Valley boy learned, um, you know, growing up in the middle of L.A. So say something, though, about that part, about finding an ethic of service. Mm. You, was it when you were a kid? Is it, is it early experiences that you had in high school? Or just what made you love that? I don't know. I guess kids are pliable. You can tell them you got to do anything, and it just becomes part of their DNA. But I never felt like I, had, I, I found it. I think it was always been there. There was an expectation of giving back. Um, the stories in my family, my grandfather on my dad's side, who came from Mexico and uh, as a one-year-old baby is a refugee from war, and becoming a citizen by serving in World War II as a volunteer. Because he wasn't a citizen, he didn't have to, but he volunteered for the country. My other grandfather, um, son of Jewish immigrants, who was a tailor who was so successful, he became tailor to the President of the United States of America, President Johnson, but was opposed to the Vietnam War, and so had to make a decision of whether he was public about that and lost his best client, or stayed quiet and, and kept him. And so he took out a full page ad in the New York Times saying, don't run for re-election, President Johnson, in 1968, and my wife and I will give you money for your retirement, and we need a different direction. So I kind of was taught, I think, an ethic of fearlessness and, in, and engaging in the world. And I think you can't also not know your own family stories, all of us in here, and not know some hardship that, that our families have faced. So when I am so active on the issue of immigration, it's also very selfish, because I see my grandfather at that border being ripped out of his mother's arms, uh, were he to have crossed this past month, rather than the opportunities he had. Uh, Jews turned away from the shores of this country in World War II, which is why human rights are important to me. So I think there was always that sense, and so I was involved in student council and Amnesty International and uh, traveled. My parents were very trusting. They, they let me do things like go to Ethiopia in high school and work with famine victims and work with human rights um, advocates in Burma right after college, and they kind of said, have, have a good time, don't, don't forget to write. And of course, my mother, being a Jewish mother, always somehow found a way to get me letters, even in the middle of the jungle, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. once a week. So yeah. thank you, Mom, if you're yeah. listening on public radio. So it, it developed organically, yes. um, and at the same time, you're also developed in other ways, like, you, you, like you're a musician, you love music, you love culture, so how did that develop? Um, my uh, mom's parents both uh, went to the Eastman School of Music uh, and to study as uh, concert pianists. They were both from L.A., didn't know each other before, but went there. Um, so I grew up with music always around my mom, played. I thought that's what I wanted to do professionally. Um, in college, I was a composer of something called The Varsity Show, an original musical that's been done since Rodgers and Hammerstein and Hart. The only time the three of them wrote together was actually this show. and. Uh, my co-collaborator was a guy named Brian Yorkey, who is the author of Next to Normal and the TV series 13 Reasons Why now, um, and a brilliant uh, guy who started winning awards once he got rid of me as his composer. But <laughs> I, I, I have a piano in my office. I have two pianos at home. Um, we're teaching our daughter to play. It's just a very important part of yeah. life for me. Yeah. So favorite jazz artist? Keith Jarrett is kind of my god. Uh, he's the one who... Uh, um, I love to sit down and improvise, and, and anybody who's ever heard Keith Jarrett, how he changed things. But 
going back, this is a weird answer, but Charles Mingus, who's known only as a bassist, was doing some of that stuff even before Jarrett uh, on, on solo piano. So I love Mingus, uh, an LA uh, mutt like myself who uh, came from all sorts of cultural background. Um, Herbie Hancock, uh, I mean, yeah, Dave Brubeck, uh, Bill Evans, Oscar Peterson's the finest player I know. Did we get you in anything else? Classic rock, alternative, Sure, yeah, no, I love anything. it all. Yeah, yeah. And my wife's from Indiana, so I've, I'm even into country music now. So. <laughs> She, so you, so you went everything. off to Columbia, um, yep. so crossing the continent uh, on your own in New York City. Um, and, and what did you major in? Uh, political science. Yeah. I know everybody thinks you never use your degree in political science. I'm actually using <laughs> my degree in political science. So, so kids, study political science. <laughs> one of the cool things I love about Eric is that uh, he's one of a relatively few number of politicians I know, elected officers, who did not go to law school, but instead uh, followed this intellectual trajectory that way, and maybe a little more about that in a moment. So you went to Columbia. Um, in one or two sentences, highlight of your college experience? Um, being active in New York in the late 80s, early 90s, in the tail end of the crack epidemic. I know that's not usually what you say yeah. for highlights, but the work to do in Harlem, I, a dear friend of mine, Ben Jealous, who later uh, headed up the NAACP and now is a Democratic nominee for governor in Maryland, and I started a Harlem restoration project to go into these burnt out crack dens and with uh, neighbors in Harlem start rebuilding them as um, places that people could live. And I, I loved the university, but I loved going out into the city and learning even more from um, the interaction with human beings. And it's probably the most important seed for the politics that I practice now of recognizing theories are really important to know, policies are absolutely critical to shaping our lives, but it's human interactions that should drive 100% of the foundation of our politics. Yeah. And I can't help but ask, did you ever have an ambivalent feeling about Columbia's role in Harlem? Was, you know, was that complex? No, that, that was, you know, before I'd gotten there, I think we were at a, a much better time, though. Yeah, there was some stuff. I mean, we protested some, uh, you know, Ben and I uh, uh, protested with a group of, of student activists the ending of full need financial aid and some other things that were going to hit students of color heavily. There was the uh, Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X had been assassinated that uh, Ben actually, a year after I left, got kicked out of Columbia for uh, some sort of sit-in because they were going to convert it to a biotech research facility. You know, looking back now, it's like biotech research facility in, in Harlem would have been great, yeah. but it was the disrespect, I think, of the history that um, people felt. So there were occasional flashes of that, but no, Columbia had, you know, uh, Dean Greenberg, who had ar argued Brown versus Board was our dean. Um, it, it was, I think, part of the ethic to engage in the city. And what I loved about being in a university in a city instead of cloistered off was that it demanded that you confront what you were studying in the classroom in a very immediate way. Yeah, isn't that awesome? And of course, colleges and universities are anchor institutions. They'll be there forever. You can build a lot around them. Um, so then you went off to Oxford. You won a Rhodes Scholarship. The, group that was there included some other high flyers, like uh, Cory Booker. Um, and, uh, and one of the highlights for you, I think, was that you met your wife there. Yes. We met on the plane ride over, actually. She was in the same uh, cadre of, of Rhodes Scholars, the same class. She does not remember meeting me at all on the plane. But I remember meeting her. So um, <laughs> that's all that matters. And yeah, I met my wife, the love of my life. I met friends that have stayed dear friends. And I tried to also be one of those Americans you can relate to this, who doesn't just hang out with Americans while at Oxford, so the relationships internationally. Um, and we stayed activists. We, it's funny now, we went to uh, immigrant detention centers. That, well, there's one called Campsfield that was just north of, of Oxford and protested the treatment of kind of families that were separated and people who were detained for long periods of time under British immigration law. Um, I started doing my academic work um, in Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, but at the same time was active in helping stand up a women's uh, development organization there that was ending the practice of cutting of, of girls when they became women and um, you know spent a lot of time being able to navigate not just in Oxford as you know but a great jumping off point to travel other places. So you know I want to ask you about this this experience that you created for yourself which is very impressive of joining into efforts that were not necessarily about you but where you were becoming a resource, an ally, uh, a proponent of change and, but as essentially as an outsider, in a sense, coming in, hoping to make a difference and to contribute, how do you think about that perspective, the stance of being the well-intended outsider who's there to help? 
I don't say that cynically. No, no, I just, how do you think about it's it? It's a great question. And, and you know, for me, as when I kind of provocatively said I've been this border crosser, I, I've always felt very comfortable being an in, insider and an outsider. Um, I would hear all the anti-Mexican jokes that my classmates would make because they didn't think I was. And then I'd go to my grandparents' house on the weekends where Spanish was their first language um, and have to process that. Um, at being an outsider in England, I mean, everybody's kind of an outsider in one way or another in England, so I've never sh shied away from jumping in. Um, I took a semester off to work on Kathleen Brown's campaign for governor in California, Jerry Brown's sister, um, where we ultimately lost that because immigration uh, was the dog whistle that uh, the then governor, Pete Wilson, kind of blew, and there was a companion measure he helped promote to take away uh, Prop 187, any benefits for immigrants. And I remember going back with my heart broken to Oxford, and I don't know, I was like, what can we do? And so we organized a group of Rhodes Scholars and students to fast. Now looking back on that, I'm like, I don't think California was waiting for what Rhodes Scholars in Oxford were, yeah. whether they were yeah. eating food yeah. or not, but it was an important moral moment, and the people we pulled in were folks who were South African colleagues of ours who had fought against apartheid and who got this yeah. instantly. And we, were, we spent two or three days kind of raising awareness about what was going on in California, learning about what they had been through in, in South Africa. And I've always found that if you're brave enough to cross those borders and to be both an insider and an outsider, that's really where you grow as a person and coalitions come together. Exactly. I can't help but tell you, uh, when I was at Oxford, which is about six, seven years before you, we organized a sponsored fast also. It was we were called Students for Peace in Nicaragua. <laughs> uh, it was the middle of that era. And, um, and there were a whole group of us, Rhodes Scholars and others, British students, international right. students, who gathered up and starved ourselves for a week right. uh, just, to, just to raise money for Nicaragua. So that you're, you're, I feel like Thank you for doing that. I think you're like my, my little cousin or yeah, something. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> we, did, we were just copying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so then you went off and you, you pursued uh, further graduate study, and you had this international perspective. But did you always feel as if you were going to come back home, back to L.A., and put down roots and start to serve you know, through elected office? Uh, yes and no. Yeah. Uh, yes, I always knew I'd come back to LA. For those of us from LA, I think um, I never worry about when people's children are going off to college in a different place. I'm like, don't worry, they'll come back. And, and uh, generally, if you're from LA, it's really tough to not move back to LA. So that was never a question for me. But to the second question, serve, no, I didn't, I didn't know what a city council member probably was growing up. I didn't know who mine was for sure growing up. And it was not something on my mind at all. I was very much focused on international relations, diplomacy. I was teaching. I was uh, studying nationalism and ethnicity. And human rights was my background. So I thought that there would be more currents there. And I was a little worried about coming back to LA because you hear officially those things are in New York and Washington and London and Geneva. And I was blown away by how much was on the ground. Organizations like CHIRLA, which is the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, but probably the leading immigrant rights group in the country. Um, you know, Operation USA doing incredible relief work. So I was very happy and found kind of those international uh, things in LA. And then somebody suggested to me, a, a friend of a friend, uh, who was the outgoing chief of staff for my predecessor on the city council. Hey, I, you know, after talking for a little bit, she's like, hey, I really like you. You should run for city council. And I'm sure she told this to a dozen people. But it was like that little, you know, sand in the oyster. I couldn't, like, get rid of it. Um, and most things in life, I do the gut check. Will I regret not having done this? Yeah. I was pretty confident I was going to lose. There were some really big names. But there was nobody young, and I thought I could bring a different perspective. So at 29, I bought a new pair of shoes and just started walking door to door until I wore holes through those shoes. And a year later, yeah. I was on the city council. What did Amy think about all this? Amy and my father, interestingly enough, um, both have never given me advice about whether I should run for office. My wife and my father, they're like, you have to own that. It's a, a very wise thing they do. Like, you make the decision, we'll support you, but we're never going to tell you to do something or to not do something. I think it's pretty cool, though obviously I don't know you personally, but the relationship you and Amy obviously have where you're supporting each other's aspirations and giving back as foster parents. And you say a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so my wife and I are very uh, different background. You know, I grew up obviously in Los Angeles, uh, in totally middle class family. She grew up in Indiana, all over the place in many homes. Um, you know, there was uh, she had a much more disrupted um, childhood. Grew up poor, worked her way through college, um, and won a Rhodes scholarship from Albion College, which is not you know 
there's certain schools that kind of churn out not fellows, a factory, right? Yeah. It's not a factory. Yeah. And um, she grew up as the eldest in her family. She has half and and step and had foster, but not official foster kids in the household. And since I've ever known her, she said, I want to be a foster parent. And, you know, talk about going along for the ride from what I'm doing. I said, absolutely, I support you. Um, let me know when. And we, about 10 years ago, started, well, no, no, seven years ago, started being foster parents. And uh, it changed my life. Um, it was, it's the best thing I've ever done with my life, um, bar none. And, and uh, I owe it to her that we've been engaged, but we offered to take in um, tougher to place cases because we weren't doing it necessarily to start a family, we were doing it to help. Um, siblings often get separated, older kids um, are tougher to place because people want babies and sometimes are starting families, which is a beautiful thing too. And so, uh, yeah, we've, we've had kids from day one to 17 um, spend time in our home and be part of our extended family. Thank you for doing that. It's Thank a you. huge contribution. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so you've, you won the election of the mayor in 2013, re-elected in 2017, <clears throat> but those aren't your accomplishments. The accomplishments are the work that you've been a part of. And what, what are two or three of the top things so far that you're most proud of? I, I think uh, two I would just say is kind of economic opportunity and the other one is infrastructure. And uh, also that's the last time you'll hear, hear me say infrastructure. <laughs> I won't say infrastructure again, okay, there, that was it. So building things, because we have a country that needs things built and cities rely, their commerce and their success relies on, on building things from your airport to your port, like the city of Los Angeles, together with the city of Long Beach, 40% of all the goods that come into America by sea come through our ports. Um, our airport, um, public transportation, um, housing, those things are really critical. And I think in, in just five years, LA is the undisputed infrastructure, I'll say it again, building, uh, uh, public building things, uh, place capital of the country. <laughs> All right, it's the infrastructure capital of America. I take back what I said. Can't trust politicians, they make promises and then they break them right away. Um, but we have a $120 billion program over the next 40 years on public transportation in the car and traffic capital of America, something that we won't feel the benefit of till long after I'm out of office, but will fundamentally change what the city is like. Um, on the economic opportunity side, I'm very proud that we raised the minimum wage, made community college free. Yeah. We've <laughs> realized a lot of the things Democrats are talking about and Republicans, quite frankly, are talking about too. We said, do it. You know, when Brandeis said that states are the laboratories of democracy, I think that's shifted to cities now because states' politics mirror kind of national ones now. They're very hyper-partisan. But the local level, uh, you know, we're, we're finding jobs for people coming out of prison. We're working with kids coming out of foster care, veterans coming home from war. And the biggest challenge for our economic opportunity in Los Angeles, because of our economic success and not building out the infrastructure of housing, is our housing crisis and our homelessness. So uh, we put the two largest measures in American history on the ballot, back to back, successfully passed them. That money's just starting to flow. And I think LA can show a pathway to ending, not just addressing or lessening, but ending street homelessness in a big American city. Um, so those are the, you know, we've won the Olympics, we've got two new football teams, LeBron James is coming, sorry to Cleveland. <laughs> sorry, sorry Cleveland, but you've been in the playoffs recently, we haven't. Um, but you know, those are the things I think I'm proudest of. Yeah. Now say something about the work with community colleges. So community colleges are amazing. I mean, uh, let me personalize it. Uh, our foster son, Tommy, uh, who's now 25, he moved in, he and his brother, with us when they were 15 and 17. Um, he got through college, which statistically most foster youth don't. Uh, sorry, he got through high school, which statistically most foster youth don't, but um, was never at the top of his class in anything. And it was drifting around, working in some restaurants, and I said, you know, Tommy, there's an amazing program at what's called Los Angeles Trade Tech College in culinary arts. It's better actually than the Cordon Bleu School in Los Angeles, and it's free. And um, we kind of connected him, he applied, he's going there. And one of the proudest moments of my life was last uh, January, his first semester, he came home from a 200 question test. And he was getting there early in the uh, first person to arrive, last to leave. And he'd gotten two wrong and it was the top in his class. And he's never been the top of his class in anything. And community colleges are this place where you can find your passion and you can find a skill. And this country has moved so far away from uh, letting those two things be together. It's like your passion is an abstract one and it's in the humanities or Maybe it's just, you know, coding, but you know, you don't necessarily have the passion. It's a skill you're supposed to have. 
community colleges are really the engines of opportunity, and we have the largest district in the country. So I started an LA College Promise to make college free. And as I shared with you a little earlier, our first year, we guaranteed any child graduating from our public schools in LA would go for free. Um, we boosted college attendance to those schools by 40% from our public schools in the first year. <laughs> and so I know, you know there's those who are demanding free college for everybody, and there's others who are cynics saying, you shouldn't have that or that's impossible. There actually is a pathway yeah. towards that. And I think it does run through our two uh, our two year institutions who can then really help people get to the four year institutions or get into that job that pays a middle class wage. We're very proud of a program at the Aspen Institute, our college excellence program, which is, has a major focus on helping community colleges that are achieving high graduation rates share that information with other community colleges so that we can not only make it accessible and affordable, but also help make sure that kids are getting out with degrees. I'm sure that's part of your focus. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think it's, what is 15% or something graduation rate out of our community colleges. So we want to turn these into degree and certification churning institutions, not just places you take a few classes and then never get it together. Now, I'm, I'm really interested in how you think about climate change and the role of cities in raising, calling the questions and building an agenda that can lead to progress. And has that been something that you've had to think about in your role in LA? It's a, a deep, deep part of my work and, and probably the, the biggest long-term and global uh, piece of, of my work and my fellow mayor's work, quite frankly. Um, you know, it, with climate change, you know, I hate even having to go to say the thing where, you know, this is real because you, you smell it today, right? Tell a firefighter in the Western United States that climate change isn't real. We lost one last year in the largest fire in California history. Um, and it's what keeps me up at night. We had uh, uh, the heat dome effect that was here last week um, in the Western United States and hit us with record temperatures. We had equipment that just literally melted down in our electricity infrastructure that we've never seen before. I've asked the head of, we run the largest municipal utility in the country in Los Angeles, and I've asked um, the head of it to look at the stuff that they put in Palm Springs and in the desert, because we're thinking now this is going to be the new normal. Um, so for us, this, this is not an abstraction. For Sylvester Turner, the mayor of Houston, this is not an abstraction. For um, you know, Phil Levine, who was the mayor of, of Miami Beach, where the city's being threatened with being obliterated by rising sea, uh, this is not an abstraction. So on the flip side, cities are the place where the action's at, and don't get depressed. The day that uh, Donald Trump uh, withdrew from the Paris, or said he was going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords, it's important to remember we haven't done that yet, and the deadline to do that is 10 days after the next presidential election, just FYI. Um, but anyway, the day he, did, he said that, Instead of crying in a corner and you know pulling your hair out like a lot of people did who, who are working on climate change, I, got, I picked up the phone and I started calling cities and saying, well, if he says he's out, let's say we're in. Today, that's over 400 cities representing more than 70 million Americans in 47 states who probably are more motivated now than they would have been if there was a different president. And look, building codes, transportation systems, electricity generation usually goes through cities. So I think that it is the most necessary and best platform in the world. I, I launched something between the US and China after President Obama and President Xi made their historic agreement on capping their emissions. And we held the first meeting of mayors between the two countries in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. The cities of the United States and China are responsible for 25% of all global emissions. Yeah. So just by the agreements we got there, for instance, that's where Guangzhou and, and Beijing said, we'll do it 10 years earlier in 2020. That was the biggest agreement before Paris. So I think, long answer, but the cities are where the action's gonna be at no matter what, and we are the place where we can make the difference. We're the solar capital of America now in, in Los Angeles. We've created um, you know, some 30,000 new jobs just in five years in the green sector. That's 60% of all the coal jobs left in America, and we're 1% of the population. So let's get with it for the economy, let's get with it for our health, let's get with it because of our security as well. Um, how about the question of immigration? Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. clap for the earth. Yeah. Come on. Uh, how about the question of immigration? Um, how you experience this question in LA is probably very different than many people in other parts of the country where they don't think of immigration in human terms. They don't know immigrants. Or they haven't thought about economic impacts of immigration or they haven't thought about the sort of geopolitical dimensions of what creates immigration in some cases. But you really lived it, both your, both your grandparents uh, are immigrants, and how should we as a country try to open a, a new dialogue about this topic? 
You know, I fundamentally think there's two lanes to this. One is the um, historical moral answer, and one is the practical political one. It's a little bit back to the future. Let's just remember who we are. Uh, the color may be sometimes different, um, but the history of this nation, unless you're native, is of immigration. Um, it might have been your ancestors came unwillingly in chains. It might have been that they came fleeing religious persecution, but it's, it's just so fundamentally who we are. It's, it's part of our president's family history. It's part of each one of us, and we need to tell our stories because I think we are dehumanizing who immigrants are. I mean, the, the best thing that came out of the tragedy at the border of separated kids is it rehumanized who they are. It made people who weren't thinking about this as human beings, who were listening to the dehumanizing words being used by our president of invasion and you know animals and stuff like that, that these are children. Like, can we be human beings first and feel our hearts? Um, and just to know that that's been a part of our history. On the practical side, I like to flip the script a lot. Because I think a lot of people from the outside who feel threatened about other things, you know, their job doesn't pay what it used to, they wonder if their kids can go to college, um, you know, they are looking at their health care bills and are worried. They're stressed. Uh, it's a very exciting time to live through, but a very anxious time. I've come up with a new term I call it excitement, mm -hmm. where we kind of feel anxiety and excitement all at once. But the anxiety part of it, if somebody says, oh, blame them, the script is, oh, there's a bunch of caring people who are saying, yeah, that's our history, and we should right. do this because it's right, but I got real problems and nobody's talking about my problems. I like to flip the script by saying, look, if, are you worried about crime on the streets because our president keeps, he has a fetish for MS-13? We know MS-13, it started in LA. The best force for defeating MS-13 has been the Los Angeles Police Department. We've cut gang crime in half, but we've also done it by investing in young people so they don't become MS-13 members. You know, it's not just a suppression um, approach. And, you know, I'll never stop listening to police officers over politicians when they want to turn uh, police forces into immigration enforcers. Um, I'll never stop being a pro-family politician and say families shouldn't be separated. I'll never stop being a pro-business elected official because 61% of all of the you know, uh, businesses on my main streets are started by immigrants. So I want economic prosperity, I want family unity, I want safe streets, and that runs through policies that look nothing like what's coming out of the White House and Congress right yeah. now. So, so let me ask you your thoughts about A, the status of um, the DACA, um, uh, uh, I guess I'll say abolition, uh, what may come later, immigration litigation of some, I mean, uh, legislation of some type, and secondly, the, the challenge on the border. Yeah. Well, you know, I went down with 18 mayors to the border. Um, it was a very moving experience for me because it's, uh, we were in El Paso, just next door to El Paso, and that's where my grandfather did cross over the border, as I alluded to, in his mother's arms as a one-year-old baby when I think she was 17. Um, his father had just been killed in the Mexican Revolution in the same town where Pancho Villa was assassinated, and she did what a mother does. You take your child and you start walking to save his life. Um, and it was an amazing group. It was... I think of the 18 of us, maybe six or seven were Republicans and the balance were Democrats, and, you know, some nonpartisan. And I thought the Democrats would speak about it one way and Republicans maybe would say it in a different way. Everybody was on fire. I mean, I heard Republicans speak with passion, um, Democrats, you know, speak about the practical aspects of this. But the, it, it gave me a lot of hope that America can be a nation again in the sense of a people. And when we talked about what needed to be done with family reunification, we said, secondarily, you need to live up to your own word when it comes to the dreamers. We're not asking you to do something for us or on our side in exchange for something else. Don't throw a wall as a negotiating chip on your own word. When you said, when you campaigned, Mr. President, the dreamers have nothing to worry about, prove it. When you, Republican leadership in the Congress, said, oh, we will hit this deadline, and you've missed it every single time, Live up to your word, do your job. And then, don't get stuck just with dreamers. There's so many more immigrants than dreamers that are here. They're very special, but you know there are millions of other folks who need to have a pathway towards some sort of comprehensive system. And what, what I think the Border Act was, was taking a hammer to an already broken system and just smashing it even further. And now they're looking at the pieces and trying to repair it. And I'm worried the Trump immigration policies are making us less safe. And I'll tell you why. I mean, if you have ICE agents who are in any place, there's 400 of them in Southern California. 
There's two million estimated undocumented residents of, in Los Angeles. Do the math, even if you've made that 600 ICE agents, which they want to expand it to. They're now, instead of going after the sharks that, I've always said your immigration status will not protect you if you break the law and has have, commit a serious crime in my city. So there are sharks out there, murderers or rapists, who with, with 400 people, you want them focused on getting those folks. But now they're saying, go out into the ocean and just drop the net. And they're coming back saying, look, I got 20 guppies. My numbers are up, I'm more successful. No, that shark is still out there and he's not asking somebody for their papers before they commit a crime. And so, you know, if you really wanna protect us, Mr. President, listen to law enforcement about what works. And then with the family reunification, it's just incredibly sad. We have lawyers, immigrant defenders, an amazing group in LA, they're only three years old, that have found every child, we have mostly the under five-year-olds, about 100 of them in, in the LA area, found them all and found out where their parents are using the federal database. Meanwhile, the feds themselves are saying, we're not sure how we can do this. And every day that goes by, these children are more traumatized the parents maybe have less of a chance of, of seeing them. And we will all, pay, if you're just practical about this, we will all pay for this one way or the other, financially, socially, but ethically, we have to get them reunified immediately. So my message to Washington is do your job, live up to your word. And I spoke to the president when he was president-elect and he said he wanted to do comprehensive immigration reform. So do it. So lots of people are starting to talk to you about the possibility that you might run for another office. Um, <laughs> You've got a wonderful mayor in Aspen, so yeah, yeah, right. it's not that. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so uh, I'm not going to ask you to deny the rumors or to confirm the rumors of what you might do, but um, can you imagine yourself at some other point, whether sooner or later, <laughs> Can you imagine yourself talking to the American people as a whole about um, what you would like to do as a leader of our country domestically and as, and as a leader of the country in a global <laughs> stage? Now uh, or later, at some yes, point. No, can no I, I can imagine it because I think it's what this moment demands just even as a mayor of the second largest city in America. It's what I, my, my first responsibility is to my city and I wake up every day thinking about it, but every day, I realize more and more of my city's fate is in the hands of what happens in the nation. Um, we have a mental health crisis that's led to addiction and homelessness on the streets of all the communities of this nation, and nobody's providing real leadership in DC. Um, immigration, international trade isn't an abstraction for us. We're recalculating the steel costs and slowing down the jobs for middle class tradesmen and women who would be building rail lines in my city because there doesn't seem to be any logical plan to the trade wars that are going on um, that have been launched by our, our president. Um, it is, it's, it's very easy for me because I think it's part of what my job is today. And I haven't been coy, I've, I'm thinking about whether or not what to do in 2020, though I'm pretty preoccupied with my city in 2018 elections. Remember there are elections now, Donald Trump's not on the ballot, but a Congress that enables him is, and you can make a difference right now, regardless of party, of trying to restore an America in this election. Um, but I've always been a big believer if you can bring something different, like that first city council race yeah. to a race, don't think through who else is in it, don't think through the odds, like think through what you bring. If you have an, a purity of intention, win or lose, um, that's the right thing yeah. to do. So uh, NATO meetings are occurring. Yep. Are you at all concerned about the president's posture in relation to NATO, Europe, and Russia? Yeah, it seems like, um, you know, Donald Trump has done what uh, Stalin, Khrushchev, Andropov, uh, and the rest of the Soviet presidents never could do, which is to make Russia the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, destroy our own alliance, um, and uh, he is, it's kind of like, keep your, you know, enemies close and your friends completely uninformed or divided. Um, there is no logic to what I'm seeing, and it's as somebody who served in the Navy for 12 and a half years, as an intelligence officer, as somebody who recognizes how fragile this world is, that we take these things for granted, our trade system, our uh, alliances, a NATO, um, this stuff can be shattered. And if America doesn't stand for anything, you don't always have to agree with America, but at least people knew we stood for something. Yeah. If you don't stand for anything, look at history. 
if it wasn't for a nuclear deterrent, I'd be very worried. I think that's in its own weird way something that can help keep peace. But short of that, in a pre-nuclear era, that has always led to war. Yeah. Yeah. You were in the second class of Rodell Fellows, which is the Aspen Institute's program to identify super talented Democrat and Republican and independent office holders at the state and local level. Bring them together, help them bond with one another, um, and introduce them to some of the key questions that transcend party and in, in, in sort of public life. Um, and it's probably been an you know, important early experience for you. Do you think you could, based in Washington and whatever role you might be in, do you think you could really work across the aisle? So I'm not naive. I was asked that question uh, by a reporter once. Oh, like, you know, do you think just because you're able to work well in Los Angeles where you can reduce the city's business tax and raise the minimum wage and bring Republicans and Democrats and independents together, do you think you could really do that in D.C.? No, I don't think that that's going to happen overnight. But I don't want to see it get worse. Yeah. And I do think we can, we can push it back. I don't think it'll be the era of the 1980s of Reagan and Tip O'Neill sitting down and cutting deals. Um, but I do think we... What other option do we have right now but to surrender to hyperpartisanship and a, and a country that will literally be torn apart? Um, mayors give me a lot of hope. I've always had this fantasy, like imagine if the mayors did take over Washington, D.C., Congress, and, and um, the White House. We uh, you know, have folks who, uh, similar to the story I told you before, I, I convened the Rodell Fellows, who were all local elected officials in, in Los Angeles um, with Nikki Edwards, I think last year, a year and a half ago. So these were either county supervisors, city council members, mayors. Um, and we had our little session, uh, which was our private session, no staff, no press, not betraying any confidences to, to tell you. It was funny, we went around saying, what's going on with this country? It was in the midst, I think, the election had just occurred and people were confused. And Democrats were like, yeah, you know, all these great regulations that we passed, now as mayors, like each one of these stones was well-intentioned, but like I have such a heavy backpack just to build something in my town takes so long. Like, wouldn't it be great if we as Democrats like started slashing red tape and deregulating? Not like the stuff that keeps your air and your water clean, but you know, all this well-intentioned but bad stuff that slows down the economy. And then there's another uh, Republican uh, mayor who said, I've been elected in my town, I think it was seven times. And, uh, and he said, and I've raised taxes every single term and I've never had a serious challenge. They love me in my town because they know I'm investing it in things that we know. And it hit me, like, imagine if America could have heard that. Like, here's a Republican saying, I love raising taxes because I actually spend it on real things, and my people love me raising taxes, and they trust me. I mean, I love it, but they trust me. And the Democrats saying, hey, let's deregulate and slash things and get that kind of American engine moving more quickly. Um, I do think Washington needs a dose of that. I think that we can get that back. But it's not up to us, it's up to everyone here and in local communities around the country to rise up and say that. Thank you. Perfect moment to turn to the audience and ask if some of you would like to ask uh, questions of Mayor Garcetti. We're right here. Yes. We have Mike right, Runners on down. both sides. Hi. Hi. Joni Benson from Austin, Texas. Hi, Joni. We are the fastest growing city in the country and by far the majority of the people moving there are from California, <laughs> half of them from LA area. Yeah. Does that not concern you? No, first of all, Steve Adler, you got a hell of a mayor. I love Steve, he's a great, great guy, and I love Austin, and you know, keep it weird. We got weirdos who need places to move, so you know, they go to Austin, <laughs> but L LA's a weird place um, in the sense that when I was growing up, you know, people used to always rag on LA. I'd go down to San Diego, they'd be like, oh, smell A, you're so smoggy, and it's, San Francisco would look down on us like we weren't even a city. New York was like, oh yeah, you guys are just Hollywood. And we'd always like, that's cool. Like, you know, you don't have to come. Like we knew we had something very special and I, I ne never think we had a chip on our, sh our shoulder. What does worry me, I'll say this, is that California in general, California is a very interesting state for America. Um, Frank Luntz, the pollster, the Republican pollster was telling me, you know, in all the polling he's done, he said, there's the American dream and there's the California dream and he said, people have dreams in all states, but there's no other place you don't have the Missouri dream, you don't talk about the Texas dream, it's not part of the lexicon in the same way. He said, California has always represented this hyper-American place where you could go and find opportunity, where everybody belongs, where you get a good job, good public education, and cheap housing. I am worried that we're losing cheap housing and that we will make or break as a state if we don't build out the infrastructure 
of enough housing to accommodate who's there. So yeah, we could easily, we're seeing more out migration, uh, more birth and in migration is, uh, is still causing us to have growth. Um, but I'm not worried about people leaving. You know, Boston's place you wanna go, awesome. Great place to go, enjoy your life. But if you are looking at the success, not just of California, but other places, if we don't get past our own inability to build, and this isn't just around housing, this is about infrastructure in the country, this is about high-speed rail, this is about um, our airports, this is about our energy grid, we will see those dreams begin to retract. And I think California will be less of a beacon. And I don't want California to turn into what we see in a lot of global cities where it's a barbell economy. Those who are very rich and those who serve the very rich and no middle class anymore, which is why I'm investing so much in infrastructure in that free community college and pushing my city to build more housing than we've seen in three decades. And it's tough because today it still feels like the rents are way too high and they are. And I talked to a guy who works in the film industry who said his dad in the San Fernando Valley, grandfather bought his house for $5,000. His dad bought it for $50,000. He bought his first home for 500,000. But he said, if it's 5 million by the time my daughter looks for a house, she's not living here. She'll be in Austin or someplace else. So um, we need to do that. And I think it's a metaphor for what we need to do in America. And I'm, I'm proud that we're finally in, in LA stepping up and starting to build that um, for the first time after two or three decades of really very little growth. One thing we're really seeing in higher education is that the highly selective schools across the East Coast are attracting tons of great kids from Southern California and LA. My school, Franklin and Marshall, has a whole pipeline from these outstanding schools and scholarship programs in LA. The kids are adding so much to the depth and richness of campus life. And I'm not sure we're gonna keep any of them mm -hmm. from that long, but it's really making the schools stronger. I really thank you for that. Yeah. Um, next question. So let, let's let's set a let's set a goal for ourselves that we're going to ask lots of questions. So short question and, and short answers. And short answers. <laughs> your, your question should begin Austin, with Austin. Go for it. Yeah. What? Awesome. What? Who? When? Why? Uh, and then you answer fast and see if we can get about ten or twelve done. Lightning round. So just to help us out, I'm going to go all the way to the back, straight ahead with you right there. The glasses. Yes. Two hands with Turns glasses. Out we have, yeah, we have, so we'll start with that one, which I think is John, and then we'll go to you. Yeah. Well, for our radio viewers, <laughs> yeah. try, try to use Okay, I'll try it again. Out. Turn it on. Okay. With your background in bipartisanship, what would you do to be more effective in reaching across the aisle and doing more with the... With Great, so, thank so you. in Los Angeles, we've, we're, we're doing that. I don't, I don't know if you mean at a different level, but in Los Angeles, we are. We had... Republicans who stood with us for um, raising the minimum wage. We sat down and listened on infrastructure and came together and brought a bipartisan. The, the most conservative member of our county board of supervisors was kind of my co-chair of this campaign to pass Measure M, that measure that I mentioned, which is the largest in the nation's history for infrastructure times two. Um, and in California, if you're not familiar, you need a two-thirds vote to pass a tax. So you have to have Republicans inherently in there to pass the two homeless measures. We sat down and brought you know, our Chamber of Commerce who really led a lot of this uh, work together with us. Um, it's not tough. I think most things we all wanna tackle together. Um, we wanna tackle those main things of building a middle class, of building out infrastructure, of having a prosperous economy, of reducing regulation, of cutting taxes where we can, but boosting wages. Um, I think you have to liberate Republicans to be as liberal as they are in some ways, and you have to push Democrats to be as hard-nosed and conservative as they need to be when it comes to things like balancing our budget and doing things like pension reform and all of those things that are part of a city's prosperity. And then there's moments where you can come together. I think we need more common enterprises, and one of those things was going after the Olympics. I mean, we're bringing the Olympics in 2028 for the third time to Los Angeles, and that was something we're just celebrating our city, celebrating America, and bringing a a great, great, you know, event to our town. So I think it's all of those. Yep. Hi, I'm Juan Pablo from Los Angeles. Hey, Juan Pablo. Uh, what are some of the obstacles, but also promises that you're seeing uh, to improve the homeless situation and specifically implementing the bond measure? That, that yeah. So we, the two different measures we passed, one was to build 10,000 units of housing for those who are the most chronically homeless. We have about 25,000 people who are homeless on the streets of LA City. And 10,000, probably a third of them are the most chronically homeless, so this would be to build that over a decade. 
The second measure was a quarter cent sales tax to provide services in the entire county of Los Angeles to hire the people you need. I've worked with homeless since I was 14 uh, years old in Los Angeles and in New York and other places. And it really comes down to learning one person's story and winning over their trust so that you can know, you know what brought them to the street. It's usually a combination of some trauma and high rents. So we need to build out the units of housing to bring the rents down, and we need to make sure that we understand that trauma, whether it's sexual and domestic violence, 91% of women who are on the streets have experienced one and or the other, um, war, PTSD, and our veterans, et cetera. But the biggest impediment is, is usually, it's not a big one because I think it's dying off, but it can be very vocal and very visible because the press latches onto it, is once now we are in the process of building, what hope, we hope this year will be 15 or 16, temporary housing, two to three year bridge housing places where people can go, have a bed, services, get off the street and out of their tents. As certain communities are saying, no way, not here. I don't think that's a majority voice, but all you have to be is even 10% of a community and that's a very loud voice and you're more likely to turn out for the protest of that than the support. But um, you know, I'm telling people very bluntly, where do you want them to go to the bathroom then? On the streets like they are today? Do you want them overdosing in front of your business, in front of your home? Look, this is a mother and a child living in a van. So I think you, you have to bring the morality to it and the practicality of it always. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that in Los Angeles, we had our first dip for the first time in nine years after it's gone up, and this is just as the money's starting to flow. I think once people see a building, it becomes something different. Is this an example of something that can be a bipartisan effort, or is it really just yours? No, absolutely, it should be. Uh, in Los Angeles, it is, but nationwide, it should be. Because I think it's something that links rural communities. It might not be homelessness in the rural community, because there's still a place where people can go, but drug addiction is drug addiction. I mean, if there are 10 of us who broke our legs and we went to the emergency room, we'd all get treatment. If 10 of us are, ad are addicted to heroin, uh, maybe one out of 10 of us is gonna get medical uh, treatment in this country right now, and that's an outrage. Yeah. I think that is something that could bring us together. We're, we're in the lightning round, front row right here. Here comes the mic for our radio audience. Hi, I'm, I'm Harris Sherman from Denver. I might add all three of my daughters who were raised in Colorado awesome. live in Los Angeles today. Good. good. <laughs> Have they heard about Austin? <laughs> no. No, no interest in Austin. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the issue of density versus sprawl in terms of the future of cities. When you think about climate change, infrastructure, water scarcity, air pollution, so forth. Thank you. We need density. It, we need it because it means less consumption of, uh, of carbon-emitting uh, fuels. We need it because it is an easier way to get through traffic, and we can spend more time with our families. We need it. Um, we don't need it anywhere and everywhere, no matter how badly designed it is, but we need it. And there's no city that's ever been able to grow up and deal with the social ills from homelessness to traffic without building out what we have. And I'm very proud in Los Angeles that you know we, we had hearings last week um, on densifying near a new rail line that we, are, we just opened towards the beach. And we had usual voices turning out for saying, no, no way, traffic's bad enough, don't build anything. And then we had a bunch of people who, who came and said, your upzoning, your greater density, isn't upzoning enough. You better do more. I'm a young person, I wanna stay here, I don't wanna you know, move someplace, I want the rents to come down. And that wasn't ginned up by City Hall or by developers or anybody else, it was an organic group of young people saying, we understand that density works, and that gave me a lot of hope that people can, and look at most other cities. I mean, sprawl isn't the way. Los Angeles is the most densely populated city in America now, metropolitan area. New York's only fifth. The New York, New York area is fifth. Um, and, but it sprawls so far. It's the third largest economy in the world. It's, as I said, up to 18 million people, third largest uh, urban economy in the world. So we better build up, and we better build it where we're making investments along transportation so we don't displace people. And we need, while we're building it, last thing, we have to make sure we're building affordable housing along with the luxury stuff, because otherwise you just displace people to sprawl further out. They have to get in a polluting car, come in, and the traffic's just as bad as it was. Before I call on the, nec the next question, I want to ask the college students in this audience to come up with a question, because the next question after this one has to be asked by a college student. Okay. <laughs> Coming around. And I'm looking in the back of the room where my interns are standing, for example. <laughs> I'm looking in the middle of the room where my daughter is sitting. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. I would just uh, like to get your take, your sure. opinion as well as your opinion, of how good it is as well as your opinion, and whether there's any legs to it on the three-state solution. 
of three state solution in California. There's also been the one state solution of like Cal exit of you know leaving the United States of America. I don't like either one of them. Um, I love my state and I love my nation. Um, and I, I think that uh, there is a beauty in what the state is right now. I think we can solve these problems together. And in fact, we have much more that links us. Uh, the Republican mayor of Fresno, which is in the Central Valley of Los Angeles, um, and, and I and 10 other mayors came together to get the state to step up on homelessness because it's as important to him in an inland Republican-led Northern California city or central city as it is to a coastal Southern California. And I think, we, I love that there's innovation in um, Silicon Valley and I hope they love what we're doing in Southern California. Um, so I really want to see one state. I don't. I think it's uh, it's kind of a random solution. And and I would never advocate for California leaving the United States of America. I think we need to just ship more Californians to more places. Because in those close elections, if we just had 10,000 more Californians in <laughs> Wisconsin or Texas, maybe we'd we'd flip them. So I think the question's coming from the back, and I'm, the, the lights are bright. But I believe this is a recent graduate of Columbia University. Awesome. How you doing? <laughs> What's your name? Hi, uh, my name is Ewoma Agbaudu. In Ewoma Agbaudu in May, just graduated from your alma mater, Columbia awesome. University. Congratulations, man. What'd you major in? Uh, majored in biology. Um, Never heard of it. As a pre-med student. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember I came to your, your commencement speech. Uh, awesome. When Thank you here. spoke a couple years ago. Thank you. Um, my question is about gentrification. And yep. my, I'm wondering, as our country is continuing to develop and big cities like LA or New York City um, continue to expand and more people are, are moving to different places. How do we find that balance between um, maintaining or, or growing as a city and then also um, keeping in mind not displacing uh, minority or low income, uh, low income residents? Thank you, great, great, great question. Um, you know, I use the, the word displacement more than gentrification because gentrification can mean all sorts of different things to different people. Um, is it the price of coffee or is it the color of the resident? Is it, you know, the income? Uh, or is it the rents of the apartments? But you're spot on. I mean, the New York, the Manhattan that you lived in while going to Columbia is radically different than the one that I lived in. And I'm not romanticizing what those crack dens I talked about are like, but there was income diversity and there was more racial diversity. There are a few people that bought apartments that nobody lived in because they were their third and fourth uh, home. Um, it was a much more vibrant uh, island. Still a beautiful place to visit, um, amazing place to live if you have the means to, but it's lost something. Paris, you know, in the center is, uh, you know, if you're rich enough, you can experience a great uh, time in Paris, but they don't have working class folks that live there. It's, I think, something that is really central to not just those star cities, but other places too because there's been this wonderful rush back into cities, but the cost of that has been that we are now have more poverty, higher drug uh, um, addiction, um, worse schools in our suburbs increasingly than in our urban cores. And it used to be, remember the 60s and 70s were all about white flight, it was the, the urban core nobody wanted to be in, all that investment that's come back, which is good for those urban cores, can't come at the expense of the people who helped bring that back. So in LA, I go back to what I was talking about earlier, we mandated, I chair our metro, or I rec up until recently chaired our metro system, which is building these 15 rail lines. We mandated 35% of all the housing that has to be built is gonna be low income housing. And so as we go denser, that's new housing opportunities. We don't wanna just attract great talent from around the country and the world, which LA will always do. We wanna grow it up in some of those schools you were talking about, which is why community college being free gets the pathway to the middle class. And then lastly, I think as you build out infrastructure, one of the best things you can do is not just about the displacement of planning, but making sure people get good jobs building out a city's infrastructure. So we're trying to do local hire wherever we can. So somebody coming home from prison, somebody coming back from war, uh, a youth who's emancipating from the foster care system gets a good job working on that subway line that's coming through her neighborhood and can actually make sure she sees that future right there in that neighborhood. This is a huge opportunity for the country. And did it disappoint you that the Congress hasn't given us anything on infrastructure yet? Absolutely, it was music to my ears when President Congress, everybody talked about 200 billion, but I will point this out, the same night Donald Trump was elected and they're talking about 200 billion dollars, America's cities on their own with our own voters passed 230 billion dollars of infrastructure. So yeah. I'm not waiting for the cavalry. I started a 501c3 called Accelerator for America and we're going into cities around the country and using our playbook from LA and saying, 
go do it in Cincinnati and Baton Rouge and Washington DC where they successfully did it with three yeah. different entities. So we want to build America out, but you know, if Congress does it, great. They're actually doing their job. In the meantime, we'll do it for them. Yep. Well, thank you. So we, we have reached the end of our hour. What a great interview. It's fantastic questions. I'd like to thank, thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you all to all the staff who organized, and especially the McCloskey family for endowing this lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti.